In some places, it's, it's legal to put yourself through college. I don't know. Why not? All right, let's pick up where we left off. And we were talking about a lot of the trust busting that was going on. Theodore Roosevelt's attempts to add uh, strength and teeth to the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission and busting up trust under the, anti, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Remember, the Sherman Antitrust Act required that uh, the Attorney General bring charges against companies that were trusts and then if they were seen to be having a monopoly, to break them up. Now, something else that is going to spin off from that is some regulations of big business that are going to come into effect by the wayside let's say, uh, from, from some of these other pieces of legislation. This is known as the progressive movement, progressive era people are starting to become aware of some of the abuses that are occurring in society. One of the abuses they feel uh, has to deal with the uh, processing of our food. Theodore Roosevelt was a vociferous reader. As a result, he would read several books in one day, and he had no problem doing that. As a result, you would probably find him reading while he was doing other things. One morning, he was reading The Jungle by Upton Sinclair at breakfast. One hand, he had the book, the, uh, the Jungle, and the other hand, he had you know, his Frosted Mini Weeks. And he comes across this one section, and he just loses it and just blah, throws up because of what is written in The Jungle. Now, The Jungle, written by Upton Sinclair, who was a, say it louder, muckraker, had gathered a whole bunch of stories and tales from the Chicago meatpacking industry and had compiled them into a fictional, semi-fictional account and had it published. Well, during this time period when cows were slaughtered, there was not very much concern with hygiene, shall we say. What would occur is when the cows came in, they didn't really pay attention to how the cows were, what health they were in, what have you. They would just tie them up, slice their throat, and hang them up, and let the blood congeal on the floor. Captain, you going to be okay? Yeah. All right, because this is just the beginning. And then they would skin the cow and let the, let the skin fall to the floor. And then they would put a hook in them and then they would take them off to the next spot. Well, the next spot, they chop up the parts and they trim off the parts that they needed to make the ribeyes and the T-bone steaks and all that stuff. And then they would let all the trimmings fall to the floor. You know, the fat, the gristle, all that yummy stuff that you know, we typically don't eat. And they'd let the meat go farther down. And... In this one factory where this was occurring, the main character had the job of being the sweeper. And what the sweeper did is he swept the floor. So now let me ask you, if you work in a place where there's blood congealed on the floor, there is regular, you know, you, you track dirt in on a factory floor, but there's also meat cuttings on the floor as well. What is that going to attract? Flies, what else? Maggots, what else? What? Rats. It's going to attract rats. So you're going to have flies, maggots, rats, um, and rat droppings. Because those two go together. Now this guy's job was to sweep. And he swept. And today if you think somebody's in charge of sweeping, what are they going to do? They're going to sweep, 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 take it to what? Just pan somewhere and throw it away. His job was to sweep it up into this hole in the wall. And he'd push it through this hole in the wall. And that was what he would do. So all day he would sweep, sweep, sweep hole in the wall. This is where you say, what's on the other side of the wall? Go ahead. What's on the other side of the wall? Thank you for paying attention. On the other side of the wall was where they made deviled ham. Have you guys ever had deviled ham? You go to the store, you ever see this like little egg-shaped tin about this big? 
and it will say, like, you know, deviled ham on it, and you buy it, and you open it up, there's all this kind of funk in it, you reach down, and you get this thing that looks like meat. But it's off of no animal that you've ever seen in your life. It's definitely not pig. Well, what they did is they scooped up all that stuff that he swept through, took it to this device that kind of molded it all into one lump of gunk, and then sealed it and sent it off. Now, during this time period, that was considered okay, because there were no laws against doing that. As a result, it was kind of gross, yes? Now, a little bit further in, this, in the jungle, there's a tale of another type of meat packing industry. The guy, he loses his job all the time, he goes to another job. And at this job, he is charged with being, being an individual that has a spear in his hand. Well, that's kind of odd. <laughs> See, what happens, what they did, is they took the, they took the cows up, stripped them down. That actually looks like dogs, doesn't it? I think that looks like Great Danes, kind of. And maybe it was, who knows? There weren't laws against that either. Or if you eat Chinese food. Anyway, moving on. Moving on. That was a joke for any people that like Chinese food. I love Chinese food, it's great. Especially the, you know, the cat stuff. Anyway. So, what happens now is they would put these cows on this conveyor belt. And basically what would happen is they took them to this room that was, had this humongous vat of water. And this water was boiling. And they would drop the cows into this vat of water. And it was constantly kept boiling. Well, what would happen is that the meat, once it boils, what happens to it? Meat on bone, boiled, what happens? Falls it falls off, and meat floats. So it floats to the top. And here's our lead character with a spirit. His job was to whoop, spear it and put it on this conveyor belt, and there it goes. Okay? Now think of the conditions. You have a giant vat in an enclosed room with boiling water, and you have this probably about a two foot, maybe one foot lift around this vat. And it's a contained room, pretty much. What is going to be some of the major problems? The lip is metal. Well, one's going to smell horrible. It's going to smell horrible. Yes, what else? The heat is going to make, it's going to be very hot. And what happens to, if you've ever been into a room where you, maybe there's a sauna or spa or something, what happens? It's wet and it's very foggy, yes? Correct? So what happens is you can't always see things very well. Well, what happens is, see, they drain these vats once a year. Oh, no. This is coming. That's disgusting, isn't it? They drain the vats once a year. Okay. So that grosses you out. Never drink Shine or Bach because it's about the same premise. That they, they drain the vats, they scrape the scum of it off, and they put it in water, and they call it Shine or Bach. Okay? That's how they make Bach beer. Now, I know some of you aren't old enough to drink, and you've never consumed alcohol before, but when you do get to 21 and you're able to make these decisions for yourself, consider that before you drink Shine or Bach. But anyway, moving on. So they drain these vats. And when they drain these vats, they discover two human skeletons. And one looks to the other and says, oh, that's where Bob and Ted went. <laughs> they never, you know, they checked in that day, but they never checked out. We just thought they split. And what had happened? Someone got fed human me. They were on the side, a metal lip of a giant vat of boiling water, condensation because it's in a controlled environment and it's wet around the sides. They slipped in, nobody could hear them. What happened, Catherine? Burned. They're, no, their meat rose to the top. That's disgusting. They, somebody stabbed the meat that came up, put on the conveyor belt, and you guys ate the McDonald's. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Needless to say, Theodore Roosevelt was very disgusted about this, and he used uh, this outrage that had been generated by the progressive movement to get the Meat Inspections Act passed. <coughs> now, what it does is it states that meat has to be inspected before it is actually uh, sent to be consumed. 
Why? Because some of these cows may have had some really nasty infection. Maybe they had some open sores on them that were oozing pus. I'm so glad this is right before noon. <laughs> Do this every day and I'll lose weight. That's right. And what happens is it goes into effect saying that certain guidelines must be met in order to uh, prepare meat for consumption. They have to be expected, they have to be healthy cows, and they have to be, that uh, they can't have some visible illness. Now, in addition to that, the Pure Food and Drug Act is uh, passed the same year. Pure Food and Drug Act does basically the same thing, except now it states what constitutes pure food, and it also licenses drugs to be sold. Have you ever heard the phrase "snake oil salesman"? There are people who said, "Oh, you got you got ailments, you got all sorts of these problems. We'll tell you what, this is what you need," and it, you know, it's just something that guy cooked up on his own and was selling as the latest, greatest invention, and it was people were taking their, were putting it in their bodies, and you know, now we have a way for the Food and Drug Administration to say, hey, that's good, that's not good, you can't, you can't sell this in um, the United States. Now, this then, of course, begs the question, what constitutes pure food? Well, one of my weaknesses, probably the only weakness that I have, much like Superman, and he has kryptonite, I have uh, cookies and cream, white chocolate bars, a Hershey, they're awesome, I love them, okay? And they're my weakness, and I shouldn't have them because I'm hypoglycemic, which means I, I'm, I, uh, I'm the exact opposite of a diabetic, okay? So my body doesn't know what to do with sugar that I put into it. As a result, I can't have, you know, these things, but you give it to me, I'm like, ah, and I'm going to go crazy with it, okay? <laughs> so, I actually had a student last semester say, hey, you know, when it hey. I was like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to fall for that. You know, I was able, I got a little willpower. But anyway. Is, is it bad that I considered doing that as soon as you said it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well... If you were to eat one of those pieces of candy, how would you know that it is... What, what percentage of contagion is acceptable, of icky stuff, is acceptable in it to be considered pure food and drug? <laughs> no more than three cockroach legs or half a cockroach body will constitute pure food and drug. Pure food in that. That's fun, isn't it? Mmm. Nobody's going to be eating lunch today. All right, so moving on. Well, maybe. There you go. We need to hear about Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, sir. Um, what is the book? The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Okay. I think you can find it probably. You might be able to find it on uh, iBooks for free. I think it's in public domain. One of the things Theodore Roosevelt is known about, or is known for, I should say, is this concept of a square deal. If somebody gets a square deal, what are we saying? If something is square, what do you have? Equal sides, correct? That's why it's a square, it's not a rectangle. His policy of a square deal comes from uh, his interaction in resolving the anthracite coal strike of 1902. In this coal strike, the United Mine Workers in Philadelphia were refusing to work in one of the largest coal mines in the nation. Now, anthracite is a very important type of coal. It's very dense, which means it... Uh, burns especially long. A little bit goes a long way. That's important when we get a little further here. But see, the United Mine Workers were demanding a 10% raise and what is known as a closed shop. A closed shop means that the only people able to be employed there are members of the United Mine Workers. So if you were to go and you were to sign up for a position say, hey, I want a job here, they say, you've got to be a member of the United Mine Workers first. 
Well, if you want the job, say, hey, that's no problem. Here you go. I'll, I'll pay dues to this company, to this, to this labor union. And then you would be able to be hired. <laughs> now, that's a closed shop. It's very demanding because only the people who are members of the union can be involved. Do we have unions still today? Absolutely. If you get a job in a field in Texas that has a uh, union that goes along with it, must you be a member? No, because we are a right-to-work state. You can work however you want to. You do not have to join a union. Now, the United Mine Workers are pushing for a 10% raise and a uh, closed shop. See, the problem, though, as far as the owners of this mine are concerned, is that they had gone on strike last year as well. And when they had gone on strike last year, they had demanded a 10% raise. And they got it. So now they want another 10% raise the next year. Well, if this allow goes on to be allowed, they say, what's going to happen next year? They're going to want another 10% raise. And we can't afford that. They're producing the same amount, but they're getting paid. If we agree to this, they'll be getting paid 20% more than they were two years ago. So they say we can't do it. And the mine workers refuse to listen to any arguments. And the labor, actually mean the uh, mine owners go a little bit far, go a little bit too far, you might say. They actually state uh, in, an, in an interview in a newspaper that they know that they're on the right side because God is with them. One time you invoke the deity uh, and say that he's with us here, the, the obverse definitely means that he's not with the union workers, and that grows about very poorly. Well, Nothing is nothing changes between the two sides for a considerable amount of time. Eventually, September rolls around. September, what starts happening to the environment? It starts getting cold. Now, in 1902, how are the majority of houses in the United States heated? By coal. Guess what type of coal it is? It's very special, dense, long-burning coal known as anthracite. So, people start worrying that there's not going to be enough coal to make it through the winter. And now Theodore Roosevelt decides he's had enough of this, he's going to get involved. The labor, uh, excuse me, no, not the labor, but the mine workers, excuse me, <laughs> mine owners, sorry, I get confused here. The mine owners say, yes, get involved, come on, bring it on, we want you to be involved with us. Because just like Cleveland did in the Pullman strike, you can do now and go in with the army and bust it up and get these idiots back to work. Theodore Roosevelt says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to send the army in to, do, to, to bust the, the uh, strike up. What I am going to do is I am going to send them in. And they're like, well, what do you mean you're going to send them in? He says, I'm going to send them in and I'm going to take over the mine. I'm going to send the army into the mines to mine the coal. And you're not going to get any money from it. And the mine owner said, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's ours. Theodore Roosevelt says, who's going to stop me? And they're like, well, what do you mean? He says, do you have an army? Says, no, no, we don't have an army. Well, then how are you going to stop me? And the answer is, well, we're not. So needless to say, the United Mine Workers sit here, right here sits the mine owners, and here sits Theodore Roosevelt. In the end, the United Mine Workers do get their 10% raise, but they also agree to work an extra hour a day. So they work nine hours. The important thing about this is when, they, when Theodore Roosevelt comes out and says, this issue is done, he says, I am pleased with the outcome because everybody got a square deal. Now, have you heard square deal before? Yes. Have you heard new deal? Yes. Yes. Have you heard fair deal? Yes. Okay. This is the era that we are entering into of people actually having names for their domestic programs. And in this instance, Theodore Roosevelt is going to coin the term square deal because everybody gets a equal share. It's a square. Now, 1904. 1904. 
Theodore Roosevelt, remember, comes into office how? Death of McKinley. He is the youngest president ever. He's 42. Youngest president ever at 42. Not the, since he was not elected president at that time period, he's not the youngest elected president ever. Anybody know who that is? It's JFK. That's right. Theodore Roosevelt is younger than him. In the 1904 election, Mark Hanna, the guy who ran the Republican Party and did not like the fact that Theodore Roosevelt was president when McKinley died, now has died himself. So the Republican Party is really without a base. No, that's wrong. Excuse me. The Republican Party is now without uh, a leader to oppose Theodore Roosevelt. Now, because of his popularity, Theodore Roosevelt is able to sweep the nomination. Nobody stands against him, and he is going to win the nomination on his own. The Democrats, bizarrely, are going to choose someone no one's ever heard of and run him for president. His name is Judge Alton B. Parker. The campaign platform that the Democrats run on is Free Silver. Why do they run on free silver? We've already talked about that. That's dead. It's done. It's over. They're beating a dead horse. Yes, they do know they're beating a dead horse, but they also know that there's no chance in winning against Theodore Roosevelt in this election. <coughs> As you can see, only the South votes for Parker. Now, why does the South vote for Parker? because he's a Democrat. The South is solidly Democrat. They're not going to vote uh, for a Republican until 1928, and that itself is a fluke. Now, with his administration confirmed, a second term won, he is going to set apart making a name for himself, set upon making a name for himself, and following up on some things that he had started in the previous administration of his. And the first is uh, dealing with conserving our natural resources. Theodore Roosevelt was an out outdoors man. He enjoyed being outside. He loved being outside. And as a result, thought everyone should be outside. Okay? This is before the NFL had get outside and spend 60 minutes a day playing. Why? Because being inside, he didn't have air conditioning. If you don't have air conditioning inside what? You don't, want to be. you don't want to be inside. You want to be outside. In 1902, Congress passes the Reclamation Act, also known as the Newlands Act. And what this did is it called for dams and irrigation projects throughout the West to try to reclaim land that was considered unsuitable for farming. He would also use his authority to set up federal forest reserves across the nation and withdraw 150 million acres of land that were considered that um, would be set apart into different areas. Uh, sorry, what exactly did you say the first act did? It creates 150 million acre federal reserves. Have you ever driven across anywhere like an I-10 go through the Dayton Crockett Forest? No. no. How about uh, it's on I-10, that's on I-45. Uh, if you go north on I-35, you go through uh, uh, the Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, grasslands. These are federal forests, but well, that's not forests, federal reserve areas that are set aside that uh, will not be leased for private entities. And what happens is it's set apart to preserve our natural resources. Which I always think is funny because Theodore Roosevelt is such uh, a hunter, as you'll see when we get a little bit further, uh, that he <coughs> loves killing things just for the sake of killing them. But when it comes down to conserving them, he also understands that if you kill everything, uh, what? There's, nothing left, There's nothing left for future generations to kill. So I mean, that's kind of how his mindset works. And... To administer the Federal Forest Reserves, he creates the National Conservation Commission. Now, I love this picture of Theodore Roosevelt right here. This, this is him in the Yosemite uh, National Forest. 
And this one right here is a cartoon that was made back uh, during his second administration. He had gone on a hunting trip with the uh, with some of his friends, and he told them, you know, I really want to shoot a bear. I really want to shoot a bear. Man, it would be awesome if I could shoot a bear. Well, his friends say, all right, know what would be funny? Let's get him a bear. Let's trap him a bear, and then he can shoot it. So what they did is they rigged up a snare, and the next day they go and check it, and they discover that they had caught a baby bear. So they get this baby bear, and they tie a rope around it, and then they tie it to a tree. And they bring Theodore Roosevelt, they're like, we found a bear! We found a bear! And they're like, what? And he's we found a bear? Yeah, we found a bear! Come on, grab him! So he grabs his rifle and runs out there. And he gets out there, and there's the bear tied to the tree. They're like, shoot it! Shoot it! There it is! He's like, I'm not going to shoot a bear. No way. Forget it. That's, a, that, that, that's, that's not sporting. That's not right. I'm not going to do it. Well, this story gets back, and it's publicized all over creation. And a small company in New Hampshire decides that, you know, this is really, this is really cute. This is really awesome. He would not shoot a little bear. And so what they do is they decide to make a representation of this incident. And what they do is they market a stuffed animal in the shape of a bear. As a result, they cannot meet the demands for this new <laughs> item they've created. They create the teddy bear. bear. Shortened version of Theodore is <coughs> Teddy Roosevelt. As a result, the teddy bear is born. Wow, how did we do that? Taylor, thank you for letting me borrow your teddy bear today. All right. <laughs> Had to call and say, hey, bring your teddy bear, because I know he sleeps with one. He told me that last year. It's kind of bizarre. Really? <laughs> Actually, no, that's my teddy bear. And hey, who's why you laughing? Everybody had teddy bears growing up. Yours might have looked like Reveille, I know, but hey. You you know. Just to this was actually given to me when my twins were born. Some uh, the faculty uh, shipped in and bought me like huge pile of diapers, like this big, which was good because I used them in the first month, and then the, the teddy bear. With it. So let's see now you know something new. There's something new you didn't know. Teddy bears came from Theodore Roosevelt refusing to shoot a bound a bear dog. Well, during this time, we are in a, hum a, a crazy period of innovation. New things are popping up left and right. They're going to completely revolutionize the way we, um, the way we live. The first is going to be Ford's Model T. Now, how many guys think... Ford created the automobile. Awesome, good. No, he did not. The automobile had been created back in uh, the 1890s. But they are not going to reach the American public in sufficient demand until a man by the name of Henry Ford is going to apply a new type of manufacturing process known as the assembly line to building them. And the first one that he's going to roll off, he's going to roll off, uh, is the Model T. And the Model T is going to be, um, is going to cost $850 when it is first mass produced. Thanks to the assembly line, they're able to make them quicker and make them cheaper. Now, why? What is it about the assembly line that makes things easier to use and makes it easier to make? Instead of having one person with all the skill sets needed to build a car from tires to roof, you have a guy who's in charge of tires. Okay, here it comes on the conveyor belt, put the tire on, rivet it on, woo, and you're done. And you do that four times and you're done. And here comes the next car. And you do it and you're done. And here goes the next car. You do it and you're done. And it costs cost down considerably. Now, Henry Ford would go on record when people complained about the colors of his colors of uh, the available colors of the Model T. And uh, he said, you know what? I will paint a Model T any color you want, as long as it's black. You know, 
Any color you can get will be black. That's the only option you have. Now, 1903. Orville and Wilbur Wright are going to do something that has never been recorded before. And that is, they're going to fly an airplane. A self-propelled flying machine. Now notice how I said that. The first recorded flight. Now why do you have to say it that way? Because we have pictures. There's a guy, I think once they down in Fredericksburg, who supposedly was flying a year before they were. However, we have no pictures of that, and if there's no pictures, what? <coughs> or will Wilbur get the get the honors? He doesn't. Now, from 1903 until 1914, the airplane is going to be seen as a novelty, as something that it really has no practical purposes, and really it's not going to take off until after World War One, when the United States government gets involved with. Uh, spending money creating airports. It is in World War I when it starts becoming seen as a weapon that it starts gaining prominence. And we'll talk more about that when we get there, but it is created in 1903 during this time period. Now, as always, we are going to have economic problems. I have often heard the United States economic cycle described as a series of stair steps. You have a period of economic boom, and then you have a depression in which things are just static, because what's happening is you have all this growth and the things race to catch up, and then you have economic boom again, and then things race to catch up, and then economic boom, and then race to catch up, economic boom, race to catch up. 1907, things were going great. Why wasn't silver a major issue in 1904? Why wasn't free silver a major issue in 1904? The Democrats said, oh, free silver, it worked in the 1900s somewhat. We lost the election, but we got a lot of people to vote for us. Then 1904, it's like, boom, nothing. Why? Because the economy was going gangbusters. When the economy is doing great, you're working a job, you're working maybe two jobs because... There is that much demand for people to work. It's not because you're not making enough. You're making so much, and you're done with the day, that you can now realize you can go and work an additional eight hours. Okay, Do 16 hours instead of eight. Why? Because you'll get paid for it, and you'll be rolling in the dough. But the problem there is that oftentimes those jobs are going to eventually disappear when the economy starts to Going back. Now, just some of the major causes of the panic of 1907 is all that Klondike gold that was being mined. It was being mined and it was being put directly into the economy. As a result, there's no control on it, so there's more gold in the economy, which means gold is going to be start becoming worth less than it had originally. Second is the Russo-Japanese War. Remember when we talked about that? The Russo-Japanese War... One of the things Japan wanted was a, an indemnity from Russia. Russia, <coughs> excuse me. Russia said, no way. Not going to do it. Japan was furious. Now, I'm reading this book by uh, Ian, uh, Ian Toll right now. It's on the Pacific War. And it's got probably the best example of summa summing up the entire... Uh, naval history of the United States in just like 20 pages of its preface. But in it, when it gets to the Russo-Japanese War, it says, here's the problem. <coughs> Japan was bankrupt. Yes, it was. But it was also mortgaged out to the hilt to England, the United States, and Germany, which means they had taken out loans, which you can understand why they wanted an indemnity. Because if they got that indemnity, what were they going to do with it? pay off their loans. But since they didn't get it, they couldn't pay their they couldn't pay their debts. Since they couldn't pay their debts, what happened? Banks in the United States either go bankrupt or they have to stop 
making loans to try to recoup the investment that they lost to Japan. Yes, sir. Okay, so why would Japan buy Russia? Russia. Russia and Japan, remember, were at war. Right. Theodore Roosevelt sat them both down, said the war's over, treated Portsmouth, right. and uh, Japan says, give us money. Russia says, we don't think so. Not going to happen. And then it wasn't pressed. That wasn't an issue that was pressed. In addition to that, 1906, the San Francisco earthquake occurs. In this earthquake, 3,000 people lose their lives, and about $5.5 billion worth of property was destroyed. That's $5.5 in our dollars today. <clears throat> Further, this, an increase in competition, which many of the pro- I mean, the anti-Roosevelt groups blamed on Theodore. Why is there more competition? There's more competition because Theodore Roosevelt has been breaking up trust. You break up trust, there's no monopolies. As a result, there's more competitors, and when you have more competitors, what occurs? Prices go down. Therefore, there's less profits, there's a lot less profit sharing through dividends and stocks, and it's a disaster. As a result, Whatever, for whatever reason, the panic of 1907 occurs, Congress passes in 1908 the Aldrich Act. The Aldrich Act calls for a National Monetary Commission, which is going to study the economic history of the United States and then make recommendations as to what can be done to prevent all these panics that are occurring every eight or ten years from occurring. We need to figure out how to prevent it. Eventually, their proposal will be enacted in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. We'll get to that in a bit. Something else the Aldrich Act allowed was it allowed for banks to circulate their own money for six years. They would be allowed to circulate their own money for six years. Now, why is that a big deal? Greenbacks are still being taken off the market. Gold is the only thing that is acceptable uh, as a rate of uh, those legal tender, and there were there were no paper dollars. That's going to change now with the Aldrich Act because banks are allowed to put forth their own money, which you probably think is a little absurd. And it kind of is, because that money is only as good as what the bank, the bank that is issuing. Now, one of Theodore Roosevelt's greatest accomplishments or his greatest legacy, is really elevating the United States as a world power prior to World War I. And one of the ways he's going to do that is known as the uh, Voyage of the Great White Fleet. The Great White Fleet is going to leave Hampton, uh, Hampton Roads uh, on the Chesapeake Bay on December 16, 1907, and return to that exact spot on February 22, 2009. 2009. That's a long trip. 1909. Sorry. Uh, and it is going to be, they're going to arrive right before Theodore Roosevelt leaves office, the last couple of weeks that he's in office, because March 4th is when the new president is inaugurated. Now, four, sh four squadrons composed of a total of 16 ships would leave Hampton Roads and sail all the way around the globe, making 20 different ports of call. These are called goodwill stops. They'd go to Japan, they went to Hong Kong, they went to the Philippines, they went to Australia, they went to India, they went through the Suez Canal, they went to Italy, you name it. They went all the way around. They were welcomed all over creation. Now, why are they called the Great White Fleet? Because they're painted white. Why are they painted white? Because it's peace time. Because in peace, our battleships were painted white. Now they don't really even bother changing the color. They're just gray. Could you imagine how much paint it would cause? It would take to do a carrier? It's a lot of paint. They would log over 43,000 miles. Now, I know you guys are saying, well, so what? How is that a big deal? It is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? It's a big deal because no other nation had done it before. It was considered too costly. It was considered 
uh, too difficult to plan logistically, and it taxed the entire planning department of the United States Navy to accomplish it. To make matters worse, when Theodore Roosevelt says, this is what I'm going to do, to Congress, it says, now give me money, they say, no, we're not going to allow you to do it. It's too costly, it's too expensive, it's going to make us a laughing stock because it can't be done. Theodore Roosevelt says, I'll show you, and sends them anyway. They get on the exact opposite side of the globe, and they run out of money. They run out of provisions. Theodore Roosevelt goes to Congress and says, hey, the Great White Fleet is stuck on the other side of the globe. <coughs> I need money to bring them home. Congress says, no, we're not going to do that. We told you not to send them. We told you not to do it, that we weren't going to pay for it, and now you're saying that they're stuck on the other side of the world, and they can't get back. He says, yes, that is exactly right. He says, we're not going to pay it. And he said, well, how do you expect them to get back then? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, we can't leave 16 naval ships on the other side of the world filled with our crew. And they're like, oh, yeah. So they, you know, pop up the money and it comes back. Now, Theodore Roosevelt had come into the office at 42. He had won his own term in 1904 and felt that he had served the time that needed to be served. As a result, he steps down and refuses to run for a second term of his own. As far as he's concerned, he's abiding by the two-term tradition. Since he doesn't run, he chooses his hand he, he chooses his hand picked successor, his heir apparent, William Howard Taft. Taft had been uh, governor of the Philippines, 1905, wrote the uh, Taft Memorandum, and then came back and was made Secretary of War to uh, Theodore Roosevelt. T.R. thought he and Taft were on the same page in all things governmental and thought he was the best successor that he could find. So the Republicans then, under TR's urgings, nominate Taft to be their uh, presidential candidate for the 1908 election. The Democrats find wherever they stash William Jennings Bryan the last time, trot him out, run him for office again. He gets up, he gives his old cross of gold speech again, you know, he's probably like 98 now, and he's all decayed and scary looking. In this election, Taft wins, but it's not as big of a landslide as it was in 1904 for Roosevelt. It is very obvious that Roosevelt's popularity does not translate to Taft. Now, Taft, you have heard of, you may not realize it's him, but you have heard of Taft before. You know why? Is he the bathtub guy? He's the bathtub guy. Yeah. Everybody knows about the president who was so fat he got stuck in the bathtub. Here he is. <laughs> During his administration, the White House was over 100 years old. It was built of uh, wood, and it was starting to decay. It was never the best built building to begin with. One day, he's walking along the second floor of the White House, and the floor beneath him gives away. Kershaw. And he falls, catches himself with his elbows, like, you know, you see on Scooby-Doo. And he's stuck there. <coughs> the biggest problem with Taft and his administration is that he is not Roosevelt. He is not Roosevelt. Anytime you follow a leader as charismatic, as forceful, as... Roosevelt, you're going to be compared to him. And then if you are not that level of leader, you're not going to compare. And that's really Taft's biggest problem. Taft's problem is that he is not Roosevelt. Everybody thought he was going to be as good as Roosevelt, but guess what? He is not. He really left a poor legacy. I mean... Who, Taft or Roosevelt? Taft. Yeah. Got stuck in the bathtub... That was good as well. Yeah, yeah. He, he gets stuck in the bathtub is not a, a good way to start any type of uh, commemoration. Of the guy. Yeah, he's a great president. Got stuck in the bathtub. It was a white three hundred twenty pounds. What? 
Yeah, he was he was well north of three hundred. Yeah. <coughs> now, one of the major things that happens in uh, tax administration is the Payne Aldrich tariff is passed in nineteen oh nine. And remember, tariffs are taxes that fund the government, and they fund the government through taxes on imports. During this time, the House of Representatives is elected by the people of the state. The senators, the Senate, members of the Senate, are elected by um, the state legislator, legislatures. So you do not vote for your senators. Today you do, yes? Through the 17th Amendment is added. And you'll see why the 17th Amendment is added in a bit. But what happens here is the tariff starts out the House, which it must, all bills that involve raising money for the government, must start in the House. So it starts out in the House, and the people who are in the House, elected by the people of the state, want a low tariff. So they pass a low tariff. It goes to the Senate, and then when it comes out of the Senate, it's now a high tariff, because they had modified it so much. Well, you can't pass a, you can't pass a bill and another bill uh, in two different houses without it being exactly the same. So what happens is it then gets modified. It gets amended to try to get it to the same level. Make it the exact same one in both House and Senate. As a result, when it comes out, it's, it's amended 800 times. And it raises the taxes on 650 items. And it lowers taxes on 200 items. Taft is never involved in this process. Why? Because he does not believe that that is the role of the president. See, Theodore Roosevelt, we can tell and we see today, is the president who changes the presidency from what it was from Washington up to Theodore Roosevelt, from where it is today, from Theodore Roosevelt to President Obama. Today, we expect the president to be a leader. Theodore Roosevelt believed it was his job to lead the government and Congress. Taft said, no, that's not the role of the president at all. I'm supposed to just sit back and sign bills. So what happens is here, we have the first evidence that Taft is no Roosevelt. Then, in 1909, Richard Ballinger, the Secretary of the Interior, takes a huge chunk of land that had been set aside as forest reserves and then leases it to companies to build hydroelectric dams. Okay, you get that? Secretary of the Interior, Interior takes federal reserve lands and then sets it and then leases it to companies to build hydroelectric dams. Okay, so what's the point? of creating federal forest reserves. Uh, preserve nature to make it look nice, make it look, keep it the way God intended, right? And now we're going to build a huge freaking hydroelectric dam there. That's all about keeping things natural, isn't it? Now, Secretary of Interior Ballinger has underneath him the chief of forestry uh, Gifford Pinshot. Pinshot does not like what he's done, what Ballinger's done, and writes a nasty letter to him. This nasty letter does not get to the Secretary of the Interior, it gets to a member of Congress, and that member of Congress reads it on the floor of the House of Representatives. So a little disagreement between two people is just blown up. Ballinger fires Pinshot. Now, you should be saying, why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because of who his best friend is. Does they guess who his friend, best friend is? Try by the name of T.R. Best friend is Theodore Roosevelt. Needless to say, that's not going to go over very well. In addition, something else that uh, Taft is going to do that changes... One of Roosevelt's major policies is 
he does away with the big stick process, the Roosevelt corollary. And he starts along the process of changing that. Instead of going in and invading Latin American countries that are not acting right and saying, you're going to do this or else, he says, you know what we should do? We should, we should, we should substitute dollars for bullets. Instead of going in with force and saying, we're going to make you act right, we're going to go, hey, you know what, we're so proud that you're a friend and you're a good member of the Latin American community and you're doing things that are right, you're upholding justice, and that's wonderful. Here's a hundred million dollars. Thanks for being so swell. And then you go over here and say, oh, never mind. Because we've got the nice Latin American country, and then we've got the not-so-nice Latin American country. And she's like, wait a minute, you gave her a hundred million dollars. Yeah, I did. Well, why? Well, because she's nice. Well, I'm nice. No, you're not as nice as she is. Well, what do you mean? Well, she's nice to her people. She pays her bills on time. She doesn't kill people. You know, she, she's, she's really great. Well, I'm great, too. I kill just a couple people. Yeah, but that's a little bit too much for us. So as a result, I want to be nice, too. This is going to be really big during the 20s and the 30s. Now, think about Theodore Roosevelt. I've always thought Theodore Roosevelt had it very hard. You know why? Because he leaves the presidency right as he's turning 50. Could you imagine being 50? I know you guys can't imagine being 50. But I tell you, you'll be here quicker than you realize. Could you imagine having probably a good 30 years of your life left and it was all downhill from there. The highest point in your life has already been achieved. I know I'm going back to my, my I'm telling you my age, I'm going back to my 20 year reunion this year for high school. And I know there will be someone there who like, hey man, do you remember that pass I threw at the station? We'll be like, yeah, but that was awesome. And we'll be like, hey, that was 20 years ago. What have you done since then? Be like, what do you mean? Is your life end in high school? Well, no, I still go to the game. Okay, then all right, that's enough. <laughs> you know, you guys are like, what are you talking about? Believe me, you'll know. Okay? You'll know. Now, so Theodore Roosevelt is 50. He has had enough of politics. He says, I'm out. I'm done. I am gone. So he takes off. He goes down to Africa, does a safari, and starts shooting every single thing he can find. You know, this is what's hilarious. He starts shooting, oh, he, he shoots over 3,000 animals on the safari. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy that he goes out and just bang, bang, bang. It starts crazy. I, I don't, oh, it's crazy. When he comes back, he has sent a lot of these items to the Smithsonian, which are still there today if you go to it. But he killed nine lions, five elephants, and 13 rhinos. This picture right here is, was taken right after Theodore Roosevelt shot the very rare white rhino. And he shot it. If it's rare, you shoot it, it's going to be extinct. But it's like, hey, there's a white rhino, bam! <laughs> well, I want that on my wall because they're rare. Yeah, are they extinct? What? They extinct? I don't think they're extinct yet, but I think probably they're, they're, they're in captivity now. Roosevelt didn't help. No, Roosevelt did not help matters any. Now, while he's gone, while he's gone, he gets letters. And he gets letters saying things like, "You can't believe, you won't believe what Taft is doing. You won't, you cannot understand the depth of the, the, the changes he's making to your legacy. You don't understand how far he is swayed from your viewpoint." A lot of them is from Pinchot himself. You would not believe what they're doing to your forests. They are putting humong they're strip mining them. They're putting up humongous dams. So. When he returns, 
He is furious. I love this picture because it shows you that old adage. What happens when an uh, irresistible force meets an immovable object? Theodore Roosevelt is the embodiment of an irresistible force. And at well over 300 pounds, it is safe to say Taft was that mountain of a man. Now to make matters worse, Taft and Roosevelt are no longer really friends because uh, Taft is just tired of being compared at every chance to uh, Roosevelt. His wife is furious, and every time she somebody says, "Well, he, you know, Roosevelt did this better. Roosevelt did this better," she nags out like, "Man, man, 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 you're just as good." Blah, 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 blah. And so you know he's tired of hearing it all. And so there's an irreparable break by the time that he comes back from safari. Now, when he comes back, he discovers that the Republican Party has split. There is a group of old guard Republicans who are like the Mark Hanna Republicans before TR had come into office, who like what Taft is doing. And then there are the people who are really upset with the changes that Theodore Roosevelt has made. Wait a no, they're really upset with the, the, that, that, that Taft had made, excuse me. And so what happens is, anytime that you have a populist, or you have a, a voting portion of the United States, it really breaks down to 50% and 50%. You have 50% Republicans and 50% Democrats. you got this mythical group called independents, which, you know, you ask somebody, hey, what party are you? Oh, I'm an independent. Well, how did you vote the last election? Straight Democrat. Well, then that's not an independent, that's a, a Democrat or a Republican. So basically, you got 50%, 50%. Now, what happens is there is a group in the Republican Party known as the National Republican, uh, National Progressive Republican League, and it is led by a man by the name of Robert LaFollette. Now, Robert LaFollette basically represents the Theodore Roosevelt wing of the Republicans. They have a plan that they believe if they show up at the Republican National Convention that they will be able to garner support to run La Follette as the rightful successor to Theodore Roosevelt. But when they get there, through political maneuvers, <coughs> Taft is nominated. Taft gets the nomination, and this makes the National Progressive Republican League very upset. They get up and they storm out. They leave. On the other hand, the Democrats have no problem. They re they nominate Woodrow Wilson. We'll talk more about him in a minute. Now, after this, Theodore Roosevelt kind of will calm down. Decides she's going to go to the Amazon and go on a on an excursion down there. Gets blood poisoning. Almost dies. Gets to the point where they have to his, his son and some of his hired men have to haul him out of the Amazon on a stretcher. His son thinks he's dead. Writes to his mother, "Dad, dead. There's no way he's going to survive this." Of course, he's Theodore Roosevelt. What happens? He survives. Okay. In case you're wondering, Theodore Roosevelt has since grown a beard. He calls himself Chuck Norris. All right. Nothing kills him. When he comes back and he's recovered from this event, he discovers that the National Progressive Republican League is trying to run a third party candidacy for president. <clears throat> trying to run their own candidate. And they want to choose La Follette, but La Follette gets really ill and can't run. So who's the next successor? Hey, Roosevelt can do it. He, he can do it. He's still alive. Let's choose him. So they choose him. And at the nominating convention, somebody asks him for the meeting, says, Mr. President, Mr. President, how do you feel? Aren't you still ill? Didn't you just recover from this uh, terrible blood poisoning? And Theodore Roosevelt being the Roosevelt, goes, no, no, ah, I feel great. I feel like a bull moose. So that's strong. Oh. And as a result, the National Progressive Republican League became known as the Bull Moose Party. Now, At a 
campaign event in Milwaukee, Theodore Roosevelt is scheduled to give a speech. And he's scheduled to give this speech next. Someone's up there speaking at this point. And he's walking to the stage to get ready when uh, a man by the name of, uh, where'd he go? Uh, John Shank sees Theodore Roosevelt and brings a gun up to shoot him. And he's aiming at his head. But somebody right next to him sees that he's got a gun in his hand and knocks his hand out. But he shoots right as he knocks his hand out. And instead of going into his head, it hits him in the chest. And he's like, oh my God, I've been shot. Oh, and he, oh, he, he, he opens his coat, pulls out his glass case, and there's a hole straight through his glass case. And it's buried in his chest. Now you say, what happens? Thank you for asking. Then he gets on the stage, gets up to the gets up to the, the lectern and says, Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize, my remarks will be brief, as I have just been shot. <laughs> <laughs> and he then proceeds to give an eighty minute speech. He gives his full speech. Then they take him to the hospital and they pull the That's the type of guy he is. But here's the problem. Anytime you have a third party running in the way, running in the United States, especially one that splits off, let's say this is the Republican Party and this is the Democrat Party. Anytime you have a uh, split in a party and that party runs two candidates, what have you done? You split the votes. Instead of one party having half, you have two parties having a fourth. Okay of the total votes. And as a result in this election, the blue is Wilson, uh, green is Roosevelt, different levels of green, different levels of blue, symbolize how heavy they went for uh, a candidate. And then uh, tap is the pinkish reddish. Now, if you were to take, and those, that's county breakdown, that's county breakdown. If you were to take Taft and Roosevelt and put them together, they would, uh, they would get 61% of the popular vote, which would have won the election for the Republicans. But since they were split, Woodrow Wilson becomes the second Democrat president since Reconstruction. Okay? Remember Cleveland did it twice, but it was the same person. Wilson is the second one since Reconstruction. Now, when he was running for office, President Wilson ran on a, a, a platform called New Freedom. And basically what we have now is you have Theodore Roosevelt's Square Deal, you have, um, you have Wilson's New Freedom, you have JFK's uh, New Frontier, you have JF, uh, LBJ's um, Great Society, you have President Clinton's <coughs> Bridge to the 21st Century, you have President Obama's Hope and Change. These are all slogans, issues that embody their domestic Platform, and we'll talk about this as we go on. Well, let's talk about Wilson for a moment. As uh, previously, he had been governor of New Jersey. Before that, he had been president of Princeton University. Before that, he had earned his PhD in political science. Looking at all of these things, especially him being a presidential scholar when it comes to studying the presidency, he knew everything about it, he should have been the most effective president we had ever had. Why? He wrote books on the presidency. However, there's a major problem. And what is that? Just because you know how things are supposed to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen that way. Doesn't mean it's going to happen that way. Yes. Sorry, what exactly was the new freedom? It's his entire domestic plan. It's just labeled new freedom. 
everything that we're going to talk about that affects the United States, Sam would be considered part of the new freedom. Okay? Now, one of the first parts of the new freedom comes uh, as a result of the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment is going to be ratified in 1913. And what it does is it now constitutionally allows Congress to tax your income. Remember, under the Wilson-Gorman tariff of 1890, Congress tried to pass a 2% income tax on people making more than four grand. The Supreme Court had struck it down, saying that's unconstitutional because it is not specifically mentioned in the Constitution that Congress can do that. Now, thanks to the 16th Amendment, Congress has the right to tax your income. Now, just because Congress is just because Congress is given the power to do something doesn't mean it automatically occurs. What happens is Congress has to pass a bill that says, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to tax you. This is how we're going to do it. And they do that with the Underwood-Simmons Tariff of 1913. First major thing you should realize is look what they do. They lower the tariff from 45% down to 25%. Now, why do they lower it so far? Jason? It's going to be made up by the income tax. It's going to be made up by the income tax. Remember, I've always said tariffs are the gateway drug for the federal government. They get a taste of the good stuff, and they want something harder. Next thing you know, they're doing crystal meth, which in the federal government version, is income tax. And 1% and 6%. It's kind of funny these days. 1% of income tax would be placed on people who made $3,000 or higher. 1%. And then 6% on 50000 or more. What is it today? The highest rate. 35%, 35% is what you pay. That's just federal income tax. If you live in like New York, there's a 15% additional state income tax that you pay. So 50% of your income in places like New York goes, will be paid before you get, actually, well, you know, you have to pay that income taxes. You don't get to keep that. Which is why, if you look demographically in the last couple of years, people are fleeing from New York and they're moving to places like Texas. In the 20, the 2000 census, New York went from being second in the nation in population to third. Texas became second in the nation. And Texas has, uh, has gotten in the last 20 years Six more electoral votes, six more representatives, and each representative represents about 60,000 people. So we've, our population has grown substantially. <coughs> All right, we're going to stop for now, but that does not mean that you're uh, free to leave.